Today we're going to be talking about this newly proposed treatment for all cancers. I've been uh, making a series of videos about this new concept that has been proposed as to what causes cancer, cancers, and this is in general for all cancers, and the same group of authors as a consequence also proposed treatment for all cancers. This is one of the reasons why I was very interested in this. That's reason number one. And uh, reason number two is because also I've been uh, obviously receiving a lot of um, comments from cancer patients and I really can't really cope with it, reading and answering these comments. But at least what I can do for you is look for information as to what can people do on their own. And this is why this particular method was of great interest to me because some of these interventions, your 10 interventions that were proposed, some of these are basically life intervention, lifestyle interventions like diet. So of great interest to me. All right, so then that's uh, another reason. To, so to give you an example and um, of all of these interventions, there's only two drugs used, only two medications, three if you're dealing with metastatic cancers. The rest is you're dealing with uh, micronutrients and vitamins and, and otherwise it's diet and physical activity. So that's very cool. And uh, the final reason why I thought this was really interesting because the, out, the way I read this paper, the authors were also very proud in stating that this is especially good intervention, they think, for metastatic cancers. So um, in terms of the background, just to reiterate the background very briefly, the way this works is as follows. What you need to do is the primary goal of this intervention is to target cancerous stem cells. So cancer stem cells. Why? Because stem cells have the capacity to divide many, many, many times and they can turn into any type of cell. So this is very beneficial for, for tumor environment or cancer environment. Okay. So you don't want that. So you need to target this and you target it in two ways. You activate function of mitochondria. You activate the specific metabolic pathways inside the mitochondria, which, and this is so cool. If you activate these in normal healthy cells, that's good, that's of benefit, healthy cells will be glad. But if you activate the same thing, so that's improvement for healthy normal cells, but if you activate the same pathways in cancer cells, because they're completely dependent on different met metabolic behavior, you will end up killing cancer cell. So it's a very interesting, specific way to target cancer cells. So that's number one. And number two, what you need to do, and total three, obviously, because we're targeting Stem, cancer stem cells. The second one is you need to remove all the food source for cancer cells. So that's glucose and glutamate. <clears throat> and uh, again, when you remove that food source, it, uh, it can kill cancer cells as well. So very, very interesting approach. So now let's basically talk about metastatic cancer with that inf background information, because the authors remind us in order for metastasis to occur, basically, that's when cancer cells can spread to the new regions of the body. You three, multiple things need to be satisfied. And the top ones I mentioned is number one, you do need those cancer stem cells. And we can target those with activation of that mitochondria, for example, right? Number two, you need macrophages, specific type of macrophages in order to achieve this. And check out the past videos where I explain how all of these interventions work against cancer as well as the background uh, to this theory in another video and you can target the you can target the macrophages with uh, vitamin c for example and the last one is metastatic cancer is even more dependent on this glucose and glutamate fuel but they call it fermentable fermentable fuels and again you target that that specifically by removing access to this and with the, when it comes to metastatic cancer you can bring specific drugs as well to help remove that fuel source so that's the bit of background now let's talk about these interventions what are these uh, 10 interventions they divided them into the type of cancer so they divided it into low grade cancer intermediate grade and high grade cancer of course the higher the grade of cancer the more dangerous it is and the high-grade cancers would also include the metastatic cancers, obviously, right? Okay, so 
that's how they, they, they separated the, the protocols. There's also one where they mention this is what everyone with cancer should do. So we'll talk about that first. Irrespective of the grade of cancer, this is what everyone should consider. So if you have cancer, this is what they recommend in order to achieve being able to specifically target those cancer cells. So number one is vitamin D. You need to make sure your vitamin D levels are at least 80 nanograms per mil in your blood. If that's the case, oh, and by the way, the protocol that they mentioned, everything I'm going to talk about, they're talking about it that it's, um, it's for 12 weeks. Oh, and I should mention there's two warnings that they provide. Number one, warning number one is you cannot use antioxidants during this therapy because antioxidants are bad. I know vitamin C is an antioxidant. I did a video on that, but they say do not use antioxidants, especially the ones that are of the drug kind, the ones that is like prescription type of uh, antioxidants. And number two, this protocol has never been tested. Individually, all of these elements have been tested, okay, but not together. So this video is really for all the doctors and scientists as well as patients who want to start looking at this, at this protocol in order so we can start building scientific evidence to see how well and effective this truly is, okay? So keep that in mind. I need to state that because I uh, otherwise, I might forget. All right, so the first intervention for all cancer patients is vitamin D, and it's dependent on how much vitamin D you have in your blood. If you have 80 nanograms per mil of vitamin D, this is, this is 25 hydroxy vitamin D, okay? Then all you need to do is then you take 2,000 international units of vitamin D every day. Now, if you have anywhere between 60 to 80 nanograms per mil of vitamin D in your blood, then you, up, you, you increase the amount of vitamin D you would be taking and you will increase it to 5,000 international units of vitamin D in your blood, okay? Now, if you even lower, and let's say your, your vitamin D levels are 30 to 60 nanograms per mil, then you're going to increase that all the way to 25,000 international units of vitamin D per day <laughs> for those two weeks, a lot, right? And then if you are below 30 nanograms per mil of vitamin D, you're going to increase that all the way to 50,000 international units of vitamin, of vitamin D. So really, really high amount. They mentioned that these are safe um, levels of vitamin D that can be used. And you can see how important it is to correct that, according to them, to correct that vitamin D deficiency for cancer patients. All right, so that's the first one. The second, second um, supplement that they mentioned, everyone, if you have cancer, you should be considering this is zinc. And again, it depends on your blood level. So if you are anywhere between 80 to 120, um, now let's see, micrograms per decaliter, so units are different, then you're good and all you have to do is take five milligrams of zinc per day for the duration of the course. Again, remember this is 12 weeks. But if you're below that, then you need to take one milligram per kilogram of your body weight per day until you reach the appropriate blood levels. Check out the paper to see how often you should be measuring for these things. I'm just trying to make this uh, shorter video. All right, so then the next two things for all people of all cancers is next one is the diet and everyone should consider that ketogenic diet and this is to remove food source of can for cancer that's glucose and glutamate so i explained that in a previous videos so ketogenic diet we're talking about what they spe specify the amounts to talk about anywhere between 60 to 80 percent of your diet should be fat i know it sounds crazy right Somewhere between 15 to 25 percent should be protein, and only five to 10 percent should be fibrous carbohydrate. The amount of calories that people are supposed to be consuming is somewhere between 900 to 1500 kilocalories per day, so not much. And your goal is to what you're aiming to achieve is um, glucose ketone index two or lower. In, in by by doing this inter specific intervention and they also warn so i'm going to repeat this because they made it sound important that it's very important to take a lot of water when you try ketogenic diet okay then the last thing in terms of for thing to consider for all cancer patients is physical activity and they're talking about moderate physical activity where your heart rate increases 
is increased for anywhere between 45 to 75 minutes. And they mentioned uh, examples of that would be cycling, swimming, biking, and you want to do this several times a week, about three times a week. All right. If you cannot do physical activity for any reason, you're, you're simply not capable, then such patient then should consider hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And we'll talk about that uh, in a moment as well. Okay, so that's for everyone. Now we're going to move to those individual grades of cancer. We're going to obviously start with a low grade. And the reason why we have now, we're dividing this for different type of grades is because obviously the amounts of drugs might change. And now we're finally introducing the drugs. And one of these drugs has become very famous during COVID-19. The first drug that they mentioned that cancer patients with low-grade cancer should be taking is ivermectin. And they're talking about you should be taking about 0.5 milligrams per kilogram body weight three times a week of ivermectin. This is complemented with a drug called mebendazole. You'll be taking 200 milligrams of that per day. Okay, so that's for low grade. Now we're moving to the intermediate grade cancer. The, and this is finally where we're introducing vitamin C. I don't know why vitamin C was not mentioned for lower grade uh, cancer. I, that, that was not explained to me in the article. And um, I'm assuming I read this correctly and that, um, <laughs> and that um, inter only intermediate cancers now have a vitamin C. Now, vitamin C, the amount, the amount is staggering. The per, they recommend something like 1.5 grams per, of vitamin C per kilogram body weight. And this is done about three, two to three times a week as well. And they mention it sounds like an absolutely crazy amount of vitamin C, but they do mention that this is apparently non-toxic to human. So that's vitamin C. Ivermectin now is increased from... 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram body weight, again, three times a week. Mebendazole is also increased. Oh, Mebendazole is also increased from uh, 200 to 400 milligrams per day. And then your ketogenic diet is now complemented with fasting. And this is not just any fasting. This is like a heavy duty fasting. This is not for wimps. They're talking about water fasting, basically where you don't eat at all. You just consume water. And we're talking about, their mention is that, that it should be done for minimum three days up to seven days. So really serious fasting. And they mentioned that you should do this multiple times in the entire, entire pro duration of, of this um, of this intervention so we're talking about every three to four weeks if you cannot do fasting for any reason then you can attempt to use instead what they refer to as fasting mimicking diet this uh, which is a diet that consists of say broths soups juices and then maybe nut bars as i believe what they mentioned and your caloric intake is um somewhere between, I think, 300 to maybe 1,100 kilocalories per day. All right, so, and the last thing for the intermediate uh, um, grade of cancer would be people will take also hyperbaric oxygen uh, um, therapy. And that, they mentioned that this should be done, oh, I can't remember the, how, how long, it was, uh, but it was in minutes, it was somewhere maybe 30 to 45 minutes. And for 1.5 to 2.5 ATA, so what is that? Those are specific units for um, hyperbaric oxygen ter therapy, which stands for something like absolute atmospheres. And it refers to um, atmosphere you would see in the air at the sea level. So it's just increased amounts, okay? So that's hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Now for the high grade cancer, it's the same as intermediate. So this would also include metastasis cancer, except you increase the levels of drugs. And now for ivermectin, you can go anywhere between one to two milligrams of uh, ivermectin per kilogram body weight. Again, still three times a week. Membendazole also increases up to now 1500 milligrams per, per day. You can also substitute that with, I believe it was fenbendazole, except that 
if I read their literature, their literature correctly, that's still not an approved drug at the moment. So if that's the case, then basically that would mean that the doctors would have to have probably some special permission in order to use that for, for treating uh, cancer patients, okay? And this is where the third drug uh, comes in for, uh, they mentioned that for metastatic cancers, at least that's how I understood the paper, is that you can bring that third drug, which can either substitute those benzamidines or you can add it to, to the collection of drugs. So you could take up to those three drugs. And this is the DON drug, which stands for something like 6-diazo-5-oxo-l-norleucine. And this DON drug helps to further remove access of glutamate to, say, cancer cells. Again, check out the past video where I explain how every single of these interventions works according to these authors towards fighting cancer. Again, remember, you're aiming to achieve those three goals, target cancer stem cells, improve mitochondrial function inside the cells, and finally remove glucose and glutamate source for cancers because they're highly dependent on that. Why? Because the mitochondria inside cancer cells is not working anymore. That's and you use mitochondria to produce energy for the cell. So now cancers are totally dependent on, on these food sources to get energy. And they're just absolutely massively dependent on this. So you're increasing for high grade cancers, you're just increasing the level of, of drugs. Now they also mention that doctors who would try to want to use this type of approach um, with their patients, they can obviously change these amounts according to patients' needs as well. And they also mentioned that there's a variety of other options available for doctors that they can also use to help help patients and some of the ones that they mention, and I'm only going to mention the ones I can't remember off the top of my head because that list was big. It was vitamin uh, um, K, vitamin, I believe it was E, coenzyme Q10. Mm, there was um, magnesium. Mm, there was also, I think it was NADH. And uh, niacin was there uh, as well. And um, just check out the, the paper. They, they only just simply threw the list and they didn't explain further in terms of how any of these chemicals or additional sources, what they would be doing uh, in terms of help. All right, so that's it. That's the protocol for all cancer patients. I was very excited about this, at least from the prospect of the lifestyle changes. So that this is why I studied this um, con content to death. And I will be still making one more video uh, in this series where I will explain the background in a greater detail. So I'll make a one big video, okay? So, uh, but for now, I'll, I'll bid you adieu and I'll see you next time. Ciao, everyone. See you, uh, see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.